Hello and welcome everyone to the final session of Binance's Responsible Trading Summer Camp. Thanks everyone for tuning in today. Special shout out to everyone who's attended all of the sessions so far. We really appreciate your support. I'm your host, Leia Heilpern, and today we'll be showing you how to secure your crypto. You've got a jam-packed event today, so we will be watching and we'll be hearing all the different experts and how you can keep your crypto safe, protect your personal information and choose the right crypto platform for you. Finally, as usual, we're giving away $10,000 in prizes for eligible viewers. So just click the link in the description to register for the event on Eventbrite. We'll be sending a short quiz after this webinar to registered viewers. So sign up now and keep an eye on your inboxes because the first 10 to 20 people who complete the quiz will get a chance to win their share of BNB tokens, BUSD futures, trading vouchers, and some really cool Binance swag. We'll announce the winners on Binance's Twitter account within 24 hours at twitter.com forward slash Binance. So make sure that you're following them so you don't miss that. I also want to say a huge thank you to Certic and Clover Finance for supporting Responsible Trading Summer Camp. Now let's get started. Please welcome our first guest, Daniel from Binance, who'll be sharing some important personal security tips and best practices that help you keep your crypto safe. Thanks, Leia. So getting started, we're going to start off with how to secure your crypto. I'm going to share my screen here and uh, we're going to go with the basics from the very beginning. You need to secure your email. So if you are a Binance user, you need to start off by securing your email account because those can easily be hacked or your password could be fished. There are so many ways to uh, hack an email, but we're going to protect your email by First off, creating a difficult password and a unique password. It's it's something you really should have per account, and there are multiple ways of doing it. Whereas if it's like a Binance account, you might want to add a B1N to your password and just make each of your passwords unique depending on where you're using it. And if you are going to really secure your account, you might want to make an email address that's unique for Binance. That is your email just for Binance. It's not used anywhere. So that email can't be leaked uh, online and in other different sources. And if you really want to step up your security, I highly recommend getting a YubiKey or Titan key to log into, let's say, Gmail. You would, uh, with YubiKey and Titan key, you would need these physical keys to log into that email account. This just adds an extra heavy layer of security and it protects your account from being uh, compromised. Number two, use Google Authenticator. SMS authentication is very weak. Phones can be hacked, phones can be SIM swapped, and they're not as safe as Google Authenticator. And with Google Authenticator comes a big responsibility too. You have to uh, set up Google Authenticator, you have to back up those codes, and then you have to secure those codes safely. So with Google Authenticator, just setting it up isn't enough. Uh, a lot of people don't back up their Google Authenticator codes. If you didn't do it, you still have a chance to. Uh, what I recommend is disabling Google Authenticator and then re-enabling it. And when the code comes up, back that up. It could be a screenshot that's a little risky. Uh, you could write down the code. There are multiple ways of storing it and uh, protecting it. I highly recommend getting more comfortable with internet security, reading up on things, and taking your security, uh, personal security to the next level. Number three, use clean devices. So a lot of computers aren't very clean. They might have malware, they might have spyware, and this could put your cryptocurrency at risk. So you would need to start off with antivirus software if you don't have a clean machine. Or if you're a little more advanced, you could set up a virtual machine, and that would be a uh, you know a mimicked computer that you can use only for certain websites, and these could be very clean devices very easily. And if you just want to be lazy and spend a little bit of money, get a Chromebook. A Chromebook is very secure. You can't uh, really uh, install uh, malicious software. Uh, I mean, um, don't hold me to that completely, but most of the uh, malicious software is designed for Mac and PC. 
Chromebooks, uh, they're a little more difficult to crack. So if you want to be a lazy person in security, I highly recommend using a Chromebook. And number four, don't walk around with all your cryptocurrency. That is very risky. If you lose your phone, what's your backup plan? What's, what's going to happen with that? You need to uh, consider not having that on your phone and walking around with a separate device, perhaps a hot wallet with just a smaller amount of funds. And uh, you really have to consider like what is the point of failure there and what will happen if you lose your phone recovering uh, your cryptocurrency or those passwords might be very difficult, especially if you didn't back them up. So number five, don't keep all your crypto in one place. Uh, if you've heard the phrase, don't keep all your eggs in, bas in, in one basket, it, it's uh, along those lines. It's a single point of failure and you want to have multiple wallets with multiple uh, funds. You want to split everything up in case one gets compromised. So you, I personally have a mix of centralized and decentralized wallets. Centralized would be somewhere like Binance where you can log in and have your funds there. Decentralized would be your own personal crypto wallet, could be a hardware wallet, could be a software wallet. And uh, the software wallets are free, so you can create a lot of them and then you need to back that up. So let's uh, move on to the next one, protect your seed rates. No one is ever going to ask you for your seed phrase, so never share it. Like, even if they sound like they are going to help you, they sound like customer support, it's a scam. Automatically, it's a scam. Uh, think about it this way. Hey, please hand me money. Uh, that's uh, Someone would just take your seed phrase and take all your funds immediately, and uh, it's, it's really hard to explain, but... A lot of people get their seed phrase compromised, and it's something you never want to share. And you need to back up the seed phrase that's only for you. And I highly recommend splitting up that seed phrase. That seed phrase should not just completely be on your computer. It should not be in an email address. You should be writing it down, splitting it up like the first half and the second half, keeping multiple copies, protecting them in plastic, fireproof bags, and uh, keeping them in secure locations. There are multiple ways of doing of doing it, and just you can really get creative with it. And I highly recommend practicing creating a wallet and restoring it. Moving crypto. So this is a mistake a lot of people make, especially in decentralized finance. They don't know what they're doing. They don't have a lot of experience. And I highly recommend just starting off with small transactions and getting comfortable with the process because sometimes you don't know that, hey, you might need gas or there's a fee to set up this wallet and you need to start small before you scale up to larger transactions. And you need to get comfortable with the entire process before moving large funds. Otherwise, you're putting yourself at a lot of risk. And here's the risk. Number eight, watch out for scams. There's customer support scams. There's people who pretend to be Binance representatives. There's people who say you want free crypto. There's airdrop scams. There's DeFi app scams. And there are a lot of ways uh, for people to compromise your account and take your funds. Uh, someone's going to go over that in greater detail later. So we're going to move forward. Number nine, use multiple wallets. So it's great to use multiple wallets, especially to protect against malicious dApps. There are ways to limit how much you are sending, but at a basic level, you could just be using a certain wallet. Let's say you're going to use PancakeSwap or you're going to use XE Infinity. You want to be using a wallet specific to that platform, to, and you don't want to risk all your funds. You want uh, that wallet to only work for what you're going to be doing with it, and you want multiple wallets per decentralized app. Number 10, practice. Practice all of these methods. Create, remove, and restore a wallet. Back up your 2FA codes. Restore your accounts. Look for the potential points of failure. Once you get comfortable with that, you will be responsible enough to hold your crypto safely. And it's, it's not something you're going to learn immediately. It just takes a lot of time and practice. And I really hope you do because 
if you read some of the horror stories on Reddit about people losing access to their account or them getting scammed, it's it, it's pretty heartbreaking, especially when you see the crypto markets going up and that they posted these like several years ago where they missed out on all those potential gains. And with that, my part is done. I'm out. Thanks, Leia. I'll just hang out. That's cool. Let's get it stop. So my part, okay, cool. Hey, Leia. Hi. Hey, thank you so much for that. Sorry, I'm having a camera mm -hmm. issue. There we go. We're all good. Thank you so much for that. I think it's so important, um, you know, to, to talk about those risks. You mentioned SIM swaps. SIM swaps are um, very prevalent, particularly in this industry. So Daniel, it's been great. So I just want to let everybody know that Binance does take user protection and security very seriously. While platform security is critical when it comes to safeguarding personal information and funds, it's important to maintain strict personal security practices, as Daniel obviously told us. Often knowledge is your best defense when it comes to cybersecurity. So let's keep this going. I'm actually now very excited to announce that we have our next session for the day, a panel session on the topic of personal security, featuring speakers Abdul Alim, co-founder of Bitblaze, ex-government payments and security consultant. We also have Cryptogal, founder of BSC Gems, and Pavel Luptak, ethical hacker. Guys, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you. Oh, I'm great. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, really important topics that we're going through. Um, but I do want to start with learning a bit about everybody's background. So Abdul, we will come to you first. Could you please share a bit about your background, why you devoted yourself to a security field, um, and really what fascinates you most about it? Abdul, can you hear us? Okay, so Abdul might be frozen. Um, yeah, looks like Abdul's frozen, so we'll come back to him. Paval, kick us off for us. Tell us about your background and why you decided to pick this field. Uh, okay, so I have been an IT security professional for the last 20 years. Uh, me personally, I created two IT security companies. Uh, first one is called Netemba. We are focused on penetration tests and security audits. And we we have like hundreds of customers. And the second company is called Hectrophy, and it's basically a bug bounty company, what, what is... Uh, like a uh, like an Uber for vulnerabilities or Uber for hackers. Mm -hmm. And since my childhood, I have loved hacking. Uh, yeah. In my company, we, we reveal critical security vulnerabilities. Uh, we are revealing critical security vulnerabilities for many years. For example, last week, I revealed a critical vulnerability in the Slovak government system that could be exploited to download like a COVID vaccination certificate of all Slo uh, Slovak citizen, citizen. So, so last week I was able to download the uh, COVID uh, vaccination certificate of all prominent Slovak politician. Of course, everything was done uh, uh, in a, like a responsible security uh, disclosure. So we we notified the, the the government institution. So so I loved hacking. I I do it for like a, for a long time. <laughs> <clears throat> Good. It's important to do something you love. Um, makes sense if you're doing it since you were a child, then there you go. Makes sense. Um, Chris Ogle, we'll come to you. Tell me about your background, why you decided to get into this space, particularly the security side of things. Yeah, I, I actually, I guess a little bit similar to Pavel. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I've always really loved um, breaking into things and um, <laughs> not, not not really doing anything bad once once you're in there, but just the idea of getting into something you're not supposed to be is, is kind of fascinating. And um, um, I spent a lot of time doing that as a teen and, um, and then, you know, through college and then afterward, just sort of as a hobby. Uh, but once I got into the uh, crypto space uh, about eight, eight or nine years ago, um, I realized how important a lot of security is and how, um, especially the last five years or so, how how kind of ignorant a lot of the new people coming into crypto are um, yeah. of security and uh, the safety. And so um, a couple of years ago, I started to focus a lot on, I guess about three years ago, focusing a lot on um, on on trying to put in lay, layman's terms, uh, you know, some of the more um, important things that people should understand. Actually, Daniel did a great job just a few minutes ago of going through a lot of those. These are very basic and you know, rudimentary things that people should do, but but a lot of people don't understand them or haven't really taken a few minutes just to understand it. And so, um, so yeah, so my background is in kind of more in-depth uh, pen testing and and um, uh, uh, security related things, uh, 
more as a hobby than professionally like Paval, but um, but but I do enjoy it. Um, but but now a lot of my focus really is just putting things as much as possible in layman's terms for for just the regular user. Yeah, I think you make a really interesting point because we are particularly in a space which is full of professional cyber hackers. And so we particularly out of all spaces, you know, and out of all industries really have to take um, a lot of responsibility, you know, even SIM swaps, you know, the average person just doesn't know about SIM swaps. So you're right, Daniel yeah. did a great job of um, breaking that down. Abdul, great to have you back. Um, not sure if you missed the question, but I just want to get a bit of um, understand a little bit more about your background, why you decided to get into the security side of things and what really fascinates you about this area. Yeah, sorry, sorry about dropping up before I got hacked. No worries. Oh, you got hacked? No, you didn't. Joking, joking. Okay. <laughs> it was Pavel, probably. It was Pavel uh, basically uh, going around, poking around. But no, no, sorry. Um, my uh, my Wi-Fi uh, extender went down. Um, but yeah, sorry. I, I got into security. Well, computers at a very young age, eleven years old, and all I wanted really was to do play games. Um, but my brother kept beating me on this pinball game, so I decided to learn to uh, to to crack the game and change the scores. And that's when I kind of got into a, a little bit more about, I mean, it was Windows 3.1 at that time. Um, the, the internet was the most unsecure place ever. You just, you step out into the internet and you can access everything, you know, <laughs> you can access all machines everywhere, do anything you want with them. Um, and I just started harvesting machines and utilizing them for my own needs, scripting them and using them to um, build bots to hack into chat rooms and things like that and um, destroy people's online presence. Um, in, in IRC chats and all these things. So anyway, so that's what I got into it. Um, and then I went on to, I was sent him to buy uh, local government first and then national government. And we built things like the congestion charging platform for London. Um, so I hate that. I hate, I've got to I'm say, sorry, Abdul, as I, I a Londoner, I hate that. <laughs> I have Terrible. to apologize. Always getting no screwed over. That. <laughs> it makes a lot of money. It makes a lot of money. They, they do, I, I mean, know. We built um, the BBC TV licensing um, payments platform, about 200 uh, government ca uh, councils payment platform so and, and and you wouldn't believe how terribly unsecure oh my goodness these platforms really? are you could take them out in, in in no time literally i was like guys we have an, an issue with a uh, we have six payment servers which we can just flood and take out all the payments for a billion pounds a month um but anyway so this is what got into security um uh, from a personal standpoint then went professionally uh, and then started opening my own businesses really to uh, to figure out you know, how can i utilize some of these methodologies and um, hopefully build some uh, interesting companies. Yeah, that is really interesting. Um, the congestion, wow. So for those that don't know, we have to pay a fine to drive into London. So Abdul's responsible for that, basically. Yeah, um, but, but here's just one thing. One thing is if, if you drive into London and you don't pay the fine, you can't check if you have a fine. And even if you can't check it, you still get a fine 85 pounds. So sorry about that. Oh, I know. I've had about three fines in the last month, <laughs> just to let you know. <laughs> It's yeah, it's pretty, terrible. it's close to home. Um, but that's really interesting. Nothing like a bit of sibling um, rivalry to, to get your career going. So Crypto Google, we'll come back to you. Um, holding crypto requires a lot of accountability. What would you recommend um, to new users in terms of simple and secure ways to store your crypto? Yeah, um, I mean, the simplest way, I guess, to store it is, is maybe, the, I mean, it depends on how you look at things. And so like, for example, a lot of people store a lot of their crypto on centralized exchanges, right? Something like yeah. Binance, for example. Um, I did this as well, and so did a lot of other people um, a long time ago. And then you have uh, huge hacks like Mt. Gox, and then it all it all disappears, right? And and so you have to be really careful about about how you do this. And I think that Daniel made a really good point. He, he kind of puts things, he said that he was putting things in different areas. Some things are on centralized exchange, some things are on his hot wallet, some things are in cold wallets, such as MetaMask, uh, where you can actually have access to it to use on a daily basis. And I think that spreading it out like that in general is a good idea. I, th I think that in crypto, really the key, um, or maybe not the key, but a big key in making sure that you're not completely wrecked all at one time is spread things out, period. So don't have everything in one wallet. Have have things across 10 wallets or 25 wallets. I, I personally have over 100 wallets. And so if, so if I were to give out my, for some reason, be exploited or hacked or, or were to give out my um, mem phrase or you know, do any of the number of things that you're not supposed to do, the person who broke into my account would have access to one single account, right, out of a lot. And so I would get harmed, but I wouldn't be totally wrecked. And I think that that's really kind of a, you know, thing to think about. So hardware wallets, um, software wallets, aka cloud wallets, and centralized exchanges, sort of a combination of those might be the wisest. Yeah, it's a good point. People often feel they have to pick one 
and you know marry it and die with it and you obviously don't so yeah spreading out is definitely a good tip um Pavel, let's hear your thoughts okay so so basically i agree with what, what was said um uh, i'm a big fan of hardware wallets so i use like a, both bitcoin trezor t and, and ledger so i strongly recommend you to use like a hardware hardware wallets or if you're super paranoid you can still use like a like a paper wallets um uh, of course you should minimize uh, uh, using of online wallets because everything what is online can be can be hacked and usually it's the only question of time and of course uh, be prepared for all kinds of scam or social engineering attack so it just means never ever put your seed out of your hands yeah. so just don't don't reply to anyone asking for for, for your seat personal seat but basically i agree so i recommend it to use like a hardware wallet all right and abdul we'll come to you what are your thoughts are you also very pro hardware wallet uh yeah I, I for me it depends where you are who you are how much crypto you've got how much you trust yourself because um if, if you can't look after paper and you've got a, a paper wallet you, you know you're gone um, also based look depends on how much money you've got if you've got you know a hundred dollars worth of crypto and you want to buy a, a hardware wallet it's <laughs> all your money's gone on your on your hardware wallet so again depends if you've got millions then absolutely yeah secure it but also then depends you know where do you live if, if you're living somewhere where you know you could get your uh, things seized for example um, and you've got a hardware wallet that can be taken from you um, it depends, you know. Have you got people that are after your after your 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 um your funds? You know, are you do you have people that you know that are after you? You know, can you physically store something? What if you, your house burns down and you have a a physical wallet stored, you know, in, in your home? What if your safe gets um you know, robbed from your house and you have a, a a a you know your 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 device stored in there with the with the private keys? So I think it, it really depends on what you are, who you are as a person, and how much you trust yourself. Um, for, for a lot of people, you know, a, a massive exchange like Binance is actually really good um, because it just allows you to not trust yourself um, with some of your funds. But again, what Cryptocal said about spreading your wealth around 100%. And, and what Pablo said about look, hardware wallets, the most secure probably is the hardware wallets. Yeah. If I can, if I can add um, if, uh, something If you lose it outdo. and you're not responsible with it, then it's a massive issue. People are so lazy that they just want to be able to just click a few buttons and access their their, their funds. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you're constantly sending funds and receiving funds, then it also depends. You know, where do you store that? If you've got it now in a, a Trezor wallet and you want to then put it online and connect it up again and keep on moving funds around, you know, is it is it simple for you? So I think it really on a, on a case to case basis really. On what, how much you've got, how much you're willing to spend to secure it, how much you trust yourself, and where you're based. Mm -hmm. Because if you're right now based in some of these countries, you know you could have your physical assets seized um, and not get access to it. Or if you're if you're in trouble, you know, if you're a bit of a naughty boy uh, and you're in the US, you don't want to be putting your uh, your your uh, funds in, on the exchanges that are regulated because they can just access that and take it away from you. So I guess it's a it's a very personal thing, and and, and I think there's a single answer for it. But how do you want it is the safest. Um, but you've got to really think about your position right now in life. And just just to clarify it with everybody, I, I don't hold any crypto. I lost it all in a boating accident. So um, just to clarify. Yeah. Your humor is so witty. Yeah, yeah, go on, Pavel. What were you going to say? Okay, so maybe just uh, this means just another reminder, just back up your seat. Yeah, <laughs> that's very important. But anyway, back to these uh, hardware wallets. Uh, maybe I should mention like uh, two important features or security features of hardware wallets. The first one is um, like like a hidden wallet. What basically means that for each hardware wallet, you, you can basically generate like an infinite number of wallets, uh, which are protected by some passphrase. So it basically means, uh, there is, uh, for example, if you are kidnapped and or you are in a very dangerous situation and there is coercion uh and they they are trying to force you to say uh, to say or to tell them your passphrase you can still do that you can you can tell them like a fake uh passphrase uh and and still they they are not able to access your real cryptocurrencies so this is like a super cool you can have hidden wallets you can have uh, multiple uh, multiple passphrases for for multiple uh, uh, wallets and the second feature is that um, for example Bitcoin Trezor Sapper like 
more advanced option, which is called shared, uh, shared uh, shimmer scheme. What basically means that you can uh, split seed to multiple parts, and you can these you can give these parts to multiple people. So even if uh, and there have to be like a uh, some specific amount of people, for example, two or three or three people from f five people to be able to meet to reconstruct seed and to be able to access your crypto. So there are like many more sophisticated ways how to protect your crypto. Pavel, that's really interesting. So in terms of having that hidden wallet, is that available on all cold storage, like a Ledger and a Trezor, for example, or do you need to have a specific um, type of hardware wallet? Yeah, it's uh, not to be supported by Bitcoin Trezor. I'm not sure about like a, a Ledger, but I use it for a, a Bitcoin Trezor and it works perfectly. It's not to be supported. Yeah, okay, that's really it. interesting. It. Oh, it does. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I think overall, you know, it's just a bit of a rabbit hole, isn't it? Um, you, you can just keep getting more and more technical with it and start getting uh, metal plates in case your 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 house gets burned down. And it, it's just a rabbit, um, a rabbit hole, in my opinion. And I think it was Michael Saylor who put it best and is just sort of like, just remember your seed phrase in your head. Just don't write it down. Just remember it in your head and flee if you need to flee. By the way, my, my friend did an interesting thing. He he's he's tattoos tattooed his key seed phrase. That's terrible. Down, down the inside of his leg, uh, but he's missed out one word, which is the word that he's memorized. Mm. So, just in case. <laughs> so he doesn't have to because he says he never remember twenty. He'll never remember twelve words. Um, because he can't remember his password most of the time. So, so so he'll never remember 12, but he can remember one word. So the other 11 words are on, on his leg, basically. So if he ever anything happens to him, he needs to remember just one word. And wherever he goes, he's got that one word. And then there are, as long as he's got his leg, he'll be all right. <laughs> Viewers, oh, I don't gosh. recommend. That, that <laughs> does, does, uh, does he say which of the um, orientations <laughs> is missing? Is it like the 11th word kind of thing? Or is it just some random place in there? He, he didn't tell me that he didn't. He, we didn't okay, that's a good thing. Okay, okay. That's a security that was, measure. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, that's interesting. Okay, let's keep going. Um, CryptoGo will come back to you. So um, we've spoken a bit about this, but let's obviously get more information on it. What are the most common security scams and how can somebody prevent against, um, you know, falling victim to them? Okay, yeah, sure. So... So actually, I, I have a I have a document that that um that I made recently uh, for a few people that I'll I'll put onto my um my, my Twitter after this at some point, um but but I mean there there are kind of there are probably ten or fifteen really common security scams, especially in the space that I play in, which is in the DeFi world uh, these mm -hmm. days, and these are usually related to to contracts being vulnerable. Um, so so for example, a contract that someone enters into that is susceptible to um, the rug pulling via the via the um, uh, the owner of it or the scammer just taking the money away, so moving the liquidity away um, via them pulling money out of someone's wallets uh, directly uh, because of permissions and so forth. And so, so let me give you a couple of examples. So whenever you go um, and interact with a a, um, a project in the DeFi world, you have to give the permission for that project to quote unquote spend your money. So let's say that I want to exchange some ETH for some BSC, right? I have to give that project permission to spend my ETH, that is to use my ETH to buy some, some BTC. Uh, when I've done that, then depending upon what that permission looks like, I may have given them permission forever and to spend as much money as, I, as they want. And this is a problem. And so, so what ends up happening in some hacks is or, or some exploits i should say is that people give permission to a project to spend their money and then they go do the swap or they 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 submit their their money into the farm or whatever and they never revoke that permission and so since they didn't revoke that permission later that project can use that same permission to just remove all of the money from their wallet and this is exactly what happens um, in a lot of cases in other circumstances uh, people enter into projects that have blatant security vulnerabilities and and I've I've unfortunately heard recently about some of the the legal difficulties um, around prosecuting people who've who've set up these uh, set up these honeypots basically to steal people's money um, it's really hard to prosecute them because since the code is often uh, visible to people and people are voluntarily putting their money into code that is visible and that code says that the owner can steal your money then you've sort of said you're allowing them to do it, you know, um, and, and so it's really hard to prosecute that. Where's where, where's the criminality there? really? And so so I think that um, 
you know, I mean, I mean it's really, there's really, we could talk for an hour about like what are the common things uh, uh, that you should look for and, and, uh, be susceptible to. And another thing is that's really common is if whenever you go into a telegram room of a project, it's very commonly the case that you'll get an ad, uh, a message from the admin. Social engineering is probably the, 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 the easiest way to hack in crypto. I would say people often uh, will put my avatar and, and my name on telegram and, and I'll get forwarded these messages of me asking people for their seed phrases or asking them yeah. for personal information. And I'm not even very notable. You know, and so there are really notable people who who probably this happens to all the time, and uh, and folks lose a lot of money because of it. So uh, just to be clear, any time that I message you on Telegram, anyone who's listening to this, I would never, ever, ever, and and neither would anyone else on this panel ask you for anything personal uh, of yours, such as your seed phrase. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It's really important. I think that's right now one of the biggest ways in which people are losing a lot of money because, you know, let's just say, let's take Twitter as, as an example. It's really a hub for crypto. And um, there are so many fake accounts and it's very difficult um, to get Twitter to take it down, actually. Sometimes Twitter says, sorry, the, you know, the fake account hasn't violated the rules. Very strange because it's a fake account. So yeah, guys, please be careful. Always double check the handle because the handle will often be just slightly different to the, the actual legitimate person's handle. So yeah, just be careful. And, and Laya, just, uh, just really quick on that. Like one thing about the handle that's really important is like, if you see in my name there, it's Cryptogle, right? And there's an L. One thing people often will yes. do is they'll put a capital I, right? So it looks like it says Cryptogle, but actually it's Cryptogie. Yeah. Right, uh, but you can't tell that. So you got it. So maybe you want to copy these, copy the name sometimes, and put it into something that automatically lowercases. So like a form online that automatically lowercases all the letters to make sure that it actually is exactly what it looks like. Yeah, that's a great point. I get that all the time because I've got the same. I've got I's and L's in my name, so it's a bit of a nightmare. Um, Pavel, let's come to you. What would you say some of the main uh, issues are right now in terms of which scams to look out for, and how can you prevent against them? Yeah. So, <laughs> first, back to Telegram. Uh, as uh, as it was said, uh, Telegram is not end-to-end -end encrypted um, messenger app, and it's full of scam and full of spam. So, personally, I stop using it and I switch to Signal. Anyway, but uh, uh, but uh, for example, very nice example um, or one of the most dangerous uh, uh, common security scam is impersonification so we have like a multiple scam website uh for example uh i like a, in a in a in a few months i i saw like a bitcoin treasure management uh, fake web website i also saw like open sea and the thing is that these scammers they they're normally paid like a google google advertisement so so even if you are google like a open sea or bitcoin treasure uh you were able to uh to, to see this this very dangerous uh, uh, like scam website, you just click to this advertisement and and uh, you 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 just become uh, victims of this uh, scam website. Also, I noticed like a fake wallets, for example. Mm. Um, uh, despite the fact that Google and Apple are quite strict in approving the new application, in the recent month we could see. Uh, like a fake versions uh in a fake version of mobile application bitcoin treasure mobile app yeah. stealing a lot of sensitive data and it was officially approved by google into google play and, and apple to apple store so and a lot of people uh, lost a lot of money thanks to this application a fake version of bitcoin treasure mobile app so so this is really dangerous uh, because normal normally most people they totally trust uh, uh, application which are approved by Apple by, by Google and you see everything is possible so uh, so we should be definitely be aware of this impersonification um, because especially especially in DeFi or when you use a lot of tokens uh, I I noticed that the, there were like a really nasty um, impersonification scam scam attacks um, yeah great Sorry, sorry, Pava. I thought you'd finish. Keep going. Yeah, and um, another very popular method is also uh, called spear, spear phishing, which is basically like a, a email where someone is asking you for a seed uh, and asking you to pay something, uh, promising you some special rewards. So this is also like a very often. 
Yeah, the key thing, if anybody asks you to send them Bitcoin and they'll send you back double. Exactly, that's what I'm... Block, block them, report them, <laughs> run. Throw your foot, no, I'm joking. Yeah, just be careful. Um, Abdul, we'll come to you. Yeah, that's one of the, the biggest ones I've seen, actually. Send you know, one Ether and get two Ether back. And, and how people fall for these is just beyond me. It's just like... Well, I guess if, I, I guess if people are excited and there's a lot of money involved, they can do. But what mm -hmm. Pavels is very interesting because in, in Google AdWords... Um, you can use a display URL and you can use a source URL. So your display URL can actually be the real website. So you actually Google it and it shows you like, you know, myetherwallet.org. And it actually won't even be misspelled. It'll be the real spelling. But when you click on it, it'll redirect you to a wallet, a subdomain with the myetherwallet.somethingelse.com. I think I, I'm not sure if Abdul finished, but I think he's frozen. So we'll we'll just keep going. Um, but it, it's interesting whenever we talk about these security risks, because whenever I talk to people outside of the space and I tell them, you know, you've got to do X, Y and Z, they get really overwhelmed and they sort of say, oh, well, I'm just going to stick with fiat or I'm just going to stick with this. But it's not that hard once you you know, you've tried it and you've practiced it. So please don't get overwhelmed. Um, it, it, you know, it's just it's just like riding a bike. It's just something you get used to. Oh, Abdul, great to so have you sorry, back. Guys. So sorry, guys. So sorry, sorry. I've just I've just moved countries basically. So I'm in an apartment and the internet is terrible. Um, it's okay. But anyway, uh, um, so yes, yeah, so I was saying. Look, the 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 URLs can be spoofed. Um, so be extremely careful. Type it in yourself into the address bar. Do not search. Um, and even if you see something and you see Vitalik talking on a YouTube video mm. uh, with an Ether address on it, it's all fake. And they all get accepted by YouTube um, uh, as advertising. But one of, the, one of the biggest ones I've seen, which is actually people think, oh, it's never going to happen, is um, uh, ledger wallets being sent out by Amazon. Now, these ledger wallets are compromised. So if you're, even if you're buying it directly from ledger on Amazon... They are comp there's so many compromised wallets. So what they will do is the hacker will buy a wallet, they'll open it up, they will print a seed phrase, plastic, um, uh, laminate it, put it all back inside again, and using a heat gun, they will seal, seal the packaging again. And they will return that device back to Amazon saying, I don't want it, I don't want to use it anymore. Now, Amazon won't open that device to check whether it's been compromised. They'll put it back onto their their available inventory, and then when you then somebody else orders uh, a device, they will send that compromised device unknowingly to that person. So, and I've I've had I, mean, I just went to actually see an apartment. I was just talking to the the, the owner, and he said, "Oh, my, my Bitcoin disappeared." So I was like, "How?" Because I bought a, 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 a ledger wallet from Amazon. I said, "Did it have a key phrase, the seed phrase inside it?" He said, "Yes." As well, that's it's been compromised. Now that happens very very often. Um, so look, even if you're buying a Ledger wallet and you think, oh, it's, and by the way, uh, somebody else bought one and the invoice was from Ledger themselves. The invoice is a genuine invoice from Ledger purchased through Amazon, shipped by probably using Amazon's uh, fulfillment services. So even though it's a Ledger invoice, it uses Amazon's FBA mm -hmm. service. But the returns process handled by Amazon staff. So be extremely careful when buying anything. If it's got a key, key if, if it's got a seed phrase with it, it's been compromised. You have to generate that seed phrase. But I've, I've seen another, not a scam, but there was a bug which was not announced by Coinbase. So the Coinbase wallet had a bug where if you um, deleted uh, your account on the Coinbase wallet and you recreated it and then you sent it some crypto, it'll go into the old wallet address. So you think you've got, you're sending it to a new address, your handle and your login is one address and then it goes to an old address. So I just had somebody, he panicked, completely panicked. He's like, oh my God, I sent it, I displayed it, I saw it working. And I said, look, do you have your old wallet address? Because yeah, I stored it. And he put his old wallet address in with a different, got a different username handle attached to it. And it all came back and he's like, I can't believe it. How did it, how is it possible? And this is software, remember, software has bugs. So if software says to you one thing, it's not true. So software isn't the end all and be all. I can see it here. It might not be what you, you know, what you're seeing, <laughs> you can't believe what you're seeing. But yeah, there's loads of scams. Look, don't, do not, if, do not send anybody cash, and, and if somebody asks you for cash, get on a video call with them and speak to them. But again, now now with the, the, the new um, deep fakes, you don't know who you're talking to. I don't even know if you guys are real. 
You could <laughs> I'm not real. <laughs> so, so you know, anything can happen. So you've got to be very wary, very aware. Um, don't store. I mean, don't use Windows computers for starters. Like, it, it's the worst, worst operating system. Uh, all, all the all the hacks for 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 almost everything that I've seen where there's been a ransomware, it's always been Windows. You know, everything gets hacked. It's Windows. Whatever you're hacking is Windows. So just be very careful. Mm -hmm. Just just one note, if I can, um, uh, like a one year or maybe two years ago, uh, the company ledger was hacked and uh, the whole database of their uh, email addresses of their and, and like if permanent addresses of their customers, uh, the whole database was leaked. And since that time, uh, unfortunately, all your customers customers or uh, these uh, nasty, nasty attacks. You cut out for a second there, Pavel. But yeah, no, absolutely. So I think that was back in everybody who'd bought a ledger from June 2000 and uh, yeah, 20. The, their data was was leaked. Um, so a lot of people were sort of saying, you know, if you are buying one of those devices, perhaps don't use your your, your name, you know, perhaps get it delivered to um, a house which isn't yours or a local post office or something like that. Um, but yeah, for everybody watching, please don't be overwhelmed and please don't let this deter you um, from getting involved in crypto because I know that it can. Um, but like I said uh, earlier, it really is like riding a bike. Eventually you get the hang of it um, and, and it's really not that overwhelming in the end. So don't, don't let that deter you. Um, okay, we have about 10 minutes left of our Q&A. So let's push through. Crypto will come back to you. Um, so Abdul was talking about, you know, losing that money. So from your perspective, um, what would you suggest? What is the best way in recovering funds back from scams um, and from hacks? Um, you know, is it possible in any way? Yeah, it 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 is possible sometimes. I mean, I'll give a I'll give an example just because I've been personally in, involved in one recently. Uh, there was a there was a scam on Binance Smart Chain called um, Stable Magnet, and this was this was basically right after the iron finance uh uh bank run a lot of people were looking for a place to put their stable coins and this project came up out of nowhere called stable magnet and so 30 million dollars went or about 25 million dollars went in there really fast and about two weeks later the team rugged and they and they ran off and um uh i i personally took on the sort of the role um, with with a couple of people from my group uh, helping me out um, to track these guys down, and so um, they had made a few mistakes in their own security. The the hackers or the scammers had, and so um, that you know they thought that basically they could move to ETH and then go through Tornado, and then it would all just sort of sit there and disappear, and then people would forget about it. But twenty five million dollars is too much for people to just forget about, and and um, at, at least for me. And there were so many people who were really upset and thinking about committing suicide and all this really terrible stuff, you know, because a lot of their a lot of their savings have been stolen. And so, um, so going back to the the penetration testing days, let's say, uh, we're able to use some of the some of the techniques to figure out who in the world these people were, uh, track them down to Hong Kong. Uh, they oh, wow. fled to the UK um, and thought, you know, they thought they were getting away. Tracked them down to the UK. Um, found you know their hotel room uh verified yeah. everything about that and then called the gmp the greater manchester police gmp got involved went and raided them and uh 22 and a half million of that 24 million has been uh, has been recovered now and uh the majority of that is is ready to be sent back to any of the victims of stable magnet and so it is possible to recover the money it's just that you have to rely on you essentially have to rely on being um better at security than than your attackers are right and and that's not always the case it, it, a lot of times is you know a lot of times these people are really clever um and they're able to you know they, they plan this stuff out really well and then sometimes they're not so clever and they and, and they are susceptible to being hacked themselves in fact um and and they don't really follow some of the same rules that <laughs> that we're talking about here uh and so so, uh, so yeah, so, so I mean, it's possible to get your money back. I would say that if, if it's the case, you do get hacked or you do get harmed. Um, don't expect to get your money back mm. though. Expect not to, uh, but hope for the best. There are groups, you know, I have one called BSC gyms and we have a whole, it's a free thing. You go in there, you can talk and tell us what happened and we'll do our best to try and get the money back. Um, and, and there are a bunch of other ones. There's a place called rug docs. 
uh, uh, or rug doc that basically focuses on pointing out security flaws and so forth. But whenever there are exploits, they'll they'll let you know what happened and maybe there's a way to emergency withdraw and get your money back, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, I mean, kind of don't expect to get it back, uh, but but cross your fingers and talk to people who do this professionally or, or as a hobby and, and you might get lucky. Thank you for sharing that. That's really fascinating. Um, obviously, I'm UK based, haven't heard of that story. So it's really, really interesting. Um, Pavel, do you have an equally as interesting story? <laughs> yeah, usually when your crypto is gone, gone it's gone. Uh, of course, there are some exceptions. For example, recently, uh, FBI um, was able to hack like a uh, crypto thieves, and they were able to uh, get crypto crypto back. But usually, uh, usually like a uh, most uh, like crypto thieves, uh, they use like a, some some kind of basic uh, crypto mixing. They change it to Monero. Um, they use like a, a basic like anonymization using Toro I2P. So it's very very difficult to uh, to get your crypto back. Usually it's gone. Um, and but for example, I was quite successful um, in uh, uh, in uh, finding a decryption key in case of ransomware. But it's like a different kind of different kind of attack. So because uh, um, one of the most po popular uh, security attack is like a just ransomware and if you're lucky you are able to find your decryption key uh without without need to uh make a deal with the uh with these uh hackers blackhead hackers and abdul we'll come to you i think that will be the last uh question of the panel just because we're a little tight on time yeah, unfortunately, I haven't any exciting uh, adventures like Cryptogle, which is, sounds okay. fantastic to be able to uh, have to recover people's uh, crypto. I've also, but I have been involved in lots of people's crypto being stolen, unfortunately, and it's just through, through sheer stupidity people do it. You know, it's just desperation or they've just overlooked something. Um, but the, the number of stories of people just, just losing their crypto is, is phenomenal. So look, if you don't lose it, you don't want to get it back for you. But um, absolutely, look, just just, just be safe. Um, don't give anyone your keys. Absolutely not. And store it in a place where you will remember it. You know, Don't lose it yourself because that's another issue you're going to face. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think the best takeaway from all of that really is any reputable individual or company is never going to ask for your private keys and your seed phrase. And that is it, you know, so never, ever give that to anyone. Nobody is going to ask for it. Customer support doesn't need it. Um, so just be careful. Cryptogle, Pavel, Abdul, I want to thank you so much. It's been um, really valuable to hear, um, you know, your your experiences and your expertise on all of this. So thank you so much for uh, joining us on the panel today. Thank, thank you. you so much for having us. Thank you for the invitation. All right, guys, let's keep going. Um, we have one last talk. It's our keynote talk, um, keynote talk. So I would like to welcome Narelle Eng, co-founder of Clover Finance, who will share with us tips on how to trade securely in a user's Binance account. Great to have you, Narelle. Hi, everyone. This is Narelle, and I'm the co-founder of Clover Finance. Um, previously, also the head of client relations at Amber and also the head advisor of Bitham Global. So um, in today's session, I'm going to walk you through some of the tips on increasing your trading account, account security, just so you can really protect your trading account from being hacked and also add an extra layer of security to it. But before um, we really start diving in, I want to emphasize the importance of completing the KYC just because it's always easier for you to recover your account when you're able to prove your identity. So I guess we can really start on. So um, here are some of the methods that you can really use to prevent your crypto from being stolen. But um, I guess um, I've used really a lot of them. So there are some downsides to uh, probably uh, the hardware ones, but really it's for the uh, security. So um, I really have always suggested um, to go with YubiKey just because um, even though it's a little bit inconvenient, but then in cases where hacker were able to bridge your everything, they'll still need to have your physical device in order to withdraw your cryptocurrency. Um, that's why um, I think uh, users should really wait it out to see whichever 
fits you the best. It's a hardware authentication device, serve pretty much similar uh, purpose, just like the Google Authenticator, but in form of a hardware. So using Binance account as an example, users can first go to security page 2FA tab, and there's a recommendation that says YubiKey. So plug your YubiKey into the USB to uh, port to really register it, and then you have the option to create pin and also name your YubiKey. So after you're done with it, uh, Binance will really have the security verification for this, this action to both email and also Google Authenticator if you've already enabled it. But uh, after really you're done with doing so, um, really I think it's it's pretty much safe, um, safely in place after YubiKey has been bind, you can set it to when you really want to use the UB case. Is it for referral or is it for login or is it for reset password? So um, really YubiKey will be needed every time depending on the action command that you selected. So moving on next, uh, which is the Google Authenticator. So um, I guess this is the one that Binance recommend and of course I recommend it as well. So I don't uh, recommend SMS-based 2FA just like Daniel suggested earlier because it's very prone to SIM swap, which is a situation where a hacker steals your identity and claim to a service provider that they're you and your number will eventually get relinked to the hacker's phone. So this is extremely, extremely dangerous. And again, in the security page 2FA tab, there is the Google Authenticator. Enable it, download, and install the Google Authenticator. Do make sure that you're on the actual Google Authenticator download link just because there are fake sites out there. And a QR code will show up on the page stating two ways of recovery. Mm -hmm. So there is the QR code and a line of characters. So it's important for everyone to really back up their QR code um, just because um, this is actually your key to recovery in case you lost your device that has your Google Authenticator. So it's very important for you to make sure that it is backed up and also encrypted and stored properly. So I guess once you have the Google Authenticator enabled, you should receive an email to verify that you wanna bind this uh, Google Authenticator to your account. And once you've confirmed everything, you'll be prompt to enter the six digit Google Authenticator code every time when you sign into your account. And also when there's some, some sort of security change, it prompt you for that. So the codes do get regenerated every 30 seconds, just to make sure that um, you guys are aware of that. And the next one is the anti-phishing code. So um, one of the most common hacks that uh, is that actually hackers sent fake emails to trick users to a fake site to log in and steal their credentials. So it's very important to note that exchange authority will never ask you to disclose your passwords. So going to the security page anti-phishing code tab. So create your code, which can be eight to 20 characters. So it's basically your secret, your secret phrase that will help you to uh, really uh, determine the email that you receive or from real Binance and the code will show up as half censored every time before you log into your account. So really once you created the code, <clears throat> you'll need to enter your Google Authenticator that you enabled earlier to verify the security change. And last but not least, it's the uh, whitelisting addresses. So whitelist your withdrawal address will actually protect you in situation where a hacker was able to uh, steal your login credentials. Uh, attempt to withdraw your funds to their wallets. So um, this is also a very useful technique. Um, so all you have to do is to go to the security page address management tab, uh, turn the functionality on. And again, uh, Binance, uh, sorry, you, you, you might have to enter your Google Authenticator code to verify this change and add the address that you need and really include the details of the address, make a memo if it's needed. And once you have added in all the address that you need, Binance will then send over an email for confirmation. Then you're pretty much all set. You'll only be able to withdraw to the designated address that uh, you, you assigned earlier. So I think um, those are some of the major tips that um, I'd recommend the most and it's easiest. So again, um, really, I think um, all users should have these enabled just to protect themselves. Um, I, I think hackers are getting smarter and smarter these days. So um, really hope that my tips will help everyone. Um, and that's pretty much it. And I wouldn't really uh, 
do say your I mean do too much. Um this is it. Thank you so much. Narelle, thank you so much. Some really important tips there. Um, and I also want to say thank you to um, everybody who has joined, we, our speakers, our panelists, um, and of course, everybody for watching because we are now at the end of our three-day three, uh, three day seminar. So I want to thank you all so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. So although our summer camp has come to a close, Binance will definitely be bringing you more online events and educational content on responsible trading in the near future in order to create a fair and equal playing field for all cryptocurrency users. You can, of course, subscribe to the Binance YouTube channel for um, for more updates. You can follow us, um, follow Binance on Twitter to stay up to date on all the latest news. I also want to give a quick final reminder to click the link in the description and register on Eventbrite if you do want to participate in today's quiz. Once you're registered, you'll receive a short quiz in your email inbox. The first 10 to 20 people who complete the quiz will qualify for a $10,000 prize pool that includes BNB tokens, futures trading vouchers, and some really cool Binance swag. To check whether you have won, follow Binance on Twitter at twitter.com slash Binance, and all winners will be posted within 24 hours. Well, viewers, this brings us to the end of our Responsible Trading Summer Camp. We hope you learned some valuable tips and tricks and strategies to secure your trading experience. And thank you to our sponsors, Certic and Clover Finance for supporting Responsible Trading Summer Camp. My name is Leah Heilpern and it's been an honor serving you as your host. Thank you to everybody for tuning in and remember to trade responsibly.